えー、皆様こんばんは。このセミナーシリーズは。Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This defense industry forum will be held in Japanese with simultaneous interpreting into English. To change the audio channel, click the interpretation icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen.、Uh, this program is organized by ISIC Japan, produced by Bloom Pacific, sponsored by BAE Systems and Raytheon Technologies, and interpreted by Christopher Field and Paul Hersey. Uh, I would like to、uh, turn the floor over now to Isaac Japan Chairman、uh, Masanori Nishi to chair this、uh, defense forum, industry forum on the topic of technology, security, and cooperation. We welcome your comments at Isaac Japan, Isaac hyphen Japan dot org. Thank you. Welcome to. The ISIC web seminar.、Uh, I am Masanori Nishi, the chair.、Uh, this is our first seminar of 2021. In、uh, the vaccination with the newly developed vaccines has begun around the world,、uh, but it seems as if the discovery of new mutations in England and elsewhere makes it all the harder to see where this pandemic is going.、Uh, the Democratic、uh, Biden, uh, Biden administration has launched in America, and as if to emphasize its differences from the previous Trump administration, they have issued executive orders to, among other things, restore the climate treaty and rescind the U.S. withdrawal from WHO.、Uh, as Japan reimposes its emergency declaration in certain parts of Japan, deliberations have begun in the national diet、uh, towards、uh, the supplemental budget. Among all these changes, there is no sign yet of change in the U.S.、Uh, China confrontation. I'm sure everyone is aware of the debate over how to treat Huawei's 5G products in the context of the conflict between the U.S. and Japan,、uh, U.S. and China, excuse me,、uh, conflict over 5G. Some of you may remember the word COCOM. That was the organization tasked with controlling exports to the Soviet Union. There is a debate about whether this approach to high-tech exports to China makes sense, or is it in fact too late for that approach, since China has already taken so much American intellectual property. It goes without saying that leading-edge technology is a precious asset for any country. The U.S., EU, and China. All adopt various restrictions in an effort to protect such technology, and it's not just the restrictions on exports. There are also access limits being established on similar technology within Japan.、Uh, but in, in contrast to those countries and regions, Japan does not have a domestic security clearance system. So there is a debate now about whether Japan's precious technology is in fact being fully protected. Today, we have invited two people to discuss how our leading edge technology is being protected and what we need to do. First, I、uh, would introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador Miyagawa. He served as a general director of the Middle East and African,、Ameri uh, African Affairs Bureau in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as Japan's ambassador to Malaysia, and is currently security counsel in the, counselor in the National Security Agency. Uh, we've asked him to talk about the significance of international cooperation and security.、Uh, thank you, Ambassador Miyagawa.、Uh, uh, good evening, thank, ladies. Good, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Miyagawa.、Uh, Miyagawa. It's an honor for me to be able to participate in this event with security specialists. Thank you so much. I am now in the National、uh, Security Bureau as a special advisor, working on various kinds of security questions. Particularly, currently, we're looking at sensitive technology and how, among friendly countries, we can cooperate. To prevent it from going to problematic countries, and recently we're using the word tech alliance among security experts to talk about such cooperation. 
So I would like to share with you my thoughts on these questions. On these issues, certainly all of you are experts. So I think I will skip over the generalities. What kinds of issues exist in terms of government, government cooperation? I would like to make some suggestions and thus contribute to your debate. As you know, the Cold War is over and it looked as if global cooperation were uh, progressing. However, already for some years, the world has seemed to enter a third stage of post-war uh, relations. What sort of era will it be? How long will it last? we don't uh, have clear visibility. But it's almost as if uh, a lot of visually impaired people feeling a large statue from various angles and no one person really has a good picture of what this third era will look like. That's uh, my sense. But for the past few years, some trends are clear. This third era will not be an era of cooperation, but rather of conflict, particularly superpowers will give absolute priority to their own interests. That seems to be the era in which, into which we are entering. That is the sense that we are getting. It's often said that threats are judged from uh, vectors of uh, strength and intention. With respect to China, this is Japan's neighbor, so we look at China with great interest. But if you look at the synthesis of all of the uh, arrows, uh, the vectors, there are grounds for concern. Particularly, I would like to touch today on the topic of sensitive technology. Now, this tech alliance, cooperation on technology and security for about a year friendly nations have discussed this matter at uh, such forums as the G7 China and other problematic countries advanced and sensitive technology should not flow to them how should we take up the issue of it happening? How can we restrict it? How can we stop it? We must have a discussion that will contribute to greater security. Sensitive items and sensitive technology have export controls. They have a long, uh, diplomatic history. If you look at page two, uh, perhaps it's page three, there is uh, the historical background of uh, controlling sensitive technology on a slide. I'm, you may remember the Cold War. Under that regime, uh, there were such organizations as uh, COCOM and CHINCOM. NATO countries and Japan, we called, we used to refer to those countries as the Western countries, had 
strict export controls for technology to China. And those strict controls were implemented. After the end of the Cold War, this uh, framework was replaced with the Wassenaar arrangement with 42 countries participating. So COCOM and Chenkam were replaced with the Wassenaar arrangement. So the role of trying to prevent sensitive technology from uh, going to problematic countries was taken over by the Wassenaar arrangement. Unfortunately, its methods and implementation uh, were rather loose and not uh, sufficiently effective. China has not uh, yet become a member, but Russia is already a member of the Wassenaar arrangement. And the situation is such that uh, even if we try to create various restrictions, it's difficult to reach agreement. Recent issues in the US and uh, in the Europe, if you look at the next page, you will see that recently advanced sensitive technologies not so much within the government but many private uh, companies uh, own advanced uh, technology now china with the participation of its government and private sector has been targeting our private sector it's a strong word but they have been attempting to steal um, our advanced sensitive technology for a long time. And within Chinese military organizations, they have used this to try to improve their own uh, military capabilities. And they've also used it for their own economic benefit. And they've used the economic resources that they've gained thereby in order to support their uh, quick uh, military growth. Recent science and technology uh, progress includes such items that can be very dangerous militarily. For example, advanced semiconductor technology, quantum technology. Such technologies are broadly dispersed among uh, private industry. Compared to 10, 20 years ago, export controls for these uh, technologies have become far more complex than they were and more difficult as well. Now, there are several issues that we face. How should we create groups of states to try to regulate these technologies? That's one issue. And on the next page, uh, this uh, issue is uh, laid out. Such a group of governments as should it be called an alliance? That's um, debatable, I suppose. But uh, here I'm calling it a tech alliance. How should it be established? This is the first issue. COCOM and CHINCOM and the Wassenaar arrangement likely had similar problems. Economic sanctions relate to this. They must be implemented by multiple states. There's the problem whether it is sanctions or a tech alliance of coordinating differences of opinions between governments. So this will no doubt continue to be an issue. And there are three related issues that I would like to touch on now. First, 
、まあ、いわば境界っていうんですか。How do you draw the line? Of which countries will participate? So that's the first question. Who is part of the group? The more restricted the membership, the easier it is to agree on what kinds of restrictions should be in place. However, Problematic sensitive、uh, technology could、uh, still flow to problematic countries from outside the membership. If, on the other hand, you try to have a large membership, then it takes a great deal of time and effort to reach agreement on regulations. And there are even concerns that agreement might not be possible. I have witnessed such situations in my diplomatic experience. It's not easy、uh, to ensure compliance. And the more member states you have, the more difficult it, it is to keep information confidential. Even if regulations are created, There's always the temptation for states to break the agreement. China always tries, will, will probably try to、uh, tempt countries to break their agreements, and they already have, in fact. The more alluring such、uh, Chinese proposals are, the more difficult it is to resist the temptation. This is just、uh, the same phenomenon we experience in our daily lives, but there are、um, many examples of this in diplomatic history as well. So, the factors that destroy maintenance of the agreement are not limited to problematic countries making alluring proposals, but、uh, it Also, could stem from、uh, mistrust among members. Among the various intentions of member states, it could be, there could be suspicions that another member state is trying to restrict a certain technology in order to harm the interests of another member state. The more suspicion there is, the spirit of cooperation among member states、uh, suffers. This is something that、uh, has been seen many times in diplomatic experience. Now, the next page shows the second challenge, and this has to do with. Government and private sector、uh, differences domestically. As I touched on already, in recent years, many advanced and sensitive technologies have been developed outside of the government in the private sector. Firms, research institutes, universities, and so forth. Extremely sensitive technology exists、uh, in these areas now. Much of this sensitive technology, especially、uh, those technologies that can be applied to weapons, have been、um, growing rapidly. Many、uh, technologies are sensitive, but even if these technologies are not sensitive, There are some non sensitive technologies that could be used to create sensitive technologies, 
such as um, delivery systems for weapons, for example. So it's difficult to determine what is sensitive at present. It is practically impossible for governments to understand all of the sensitive technologies that the private sector has. The various components of government, even if they were able to agree with the private sector on the use of the uh, technologies, it seems difficult to think that uh, it would be possible to easily keep all of that information confidential. So this is the second issue, but it uh, relates to uh, cooperation between the uh, government and the private sector domestically. Now, even if the government were to try to implement strict regulation on the uh, private sector, this would require tremendous resources uh, on the parts of uh, on the part of the government, and it, it might be difficult uh, to uh, implement. Let me move on to the third issue on the following page. I'll uh, wrap up in a bit, but this third issue has to do with the modality of measures in order to restrict the flow of uh, sensitive technology by member states. It's difficult to harmonize regulations among member states. This is the third issue. If one or two countries tries to implement regulations, even if they're aware of which technology must be controlled, are they going to stop it from being exported? Or will they prevent private firms from investing in problematic companies? Or will they stop engineers that have access to this sensitive technology from leaving the country? Or will they stop them from talking on the telephone to people in problematic countries? These are very practical questions about how to uh, restrict uh, the flow of this technology. There could be doubts and suspicions that arise. And it could be difficult to uh, continue cooperation unless this uh, set of questions were handled smoothly. Such are the challenges that we face. And now, the difficulty of these uh, questions is something that I've just laid out for you. It's been an honor for me to do so. And look forward to a lively debate that uh, will uh, produce good proposals for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our second guest tonight was the former uh, director of the ATLA, uh, Mr. Watanabe. He was involved in uh, R&D for a long period at, at law and is very aware of the systems at, at, in use in the United States. Uh, he's going to uh, talk from the point of view of his specialty, which is communications, about what kinds of limitations can be placed on technology security cooperation. Thank you very much, Nissan, uh, for your introduction. I am Watanabe, who was just introduced. Uh, thank you for your uh, participation tonight. I don't have a lot of time, so I'd like to get right into my topic. Uh, 
uh, uh, Miyago Asam uh, talked about uh, technology alliances uh, and uh, for protecting Japan from uh, China's hegemonic uh, tendencies, this is very important. In each of the alliances, uh, countries in the alliances, uh, just recently, the US uh, uh, Department of Defense has uh, announced uh the need to face the chinese threat uh and in this slide i would like to explain this a little further today uh we're talking about technical alliances uh i will be mentioning that myself uh as a i would like to discuss a particular uh, specific example uh first of all uh at the beginning uh i'd like to talk about 5g uh, and efforts being made in that effort. The issue here is pretty clear. Uh, in 5G networks, uh, China's hegemony uh, is a big threat to world uh, security or is seen as such. Uh, if China had, uh, since China is taking a leadership role, uh, when that, under those circumstances, this is a, uh, an issue that would make it difficult to maintain security around the world. Um, specifically, as noted here, uh, in June, since June of last year, uh, the US FCC uh, just designated Huawei and ZTE as national security threats. Uh, relative to such problems, of course, uh, countermeasures have to be taken. The U.S. Uh, has said that it would uh, exclude uh, Huawei and ZTE from the 5G network. Uh, as you know, uh, allies and uh, partner countries have been introducing similar measures. Uh, uh, this is a very significant issue, a uh, very big issue, but uh, it's not just 5G, uh, as noted here, uh, at, uh, relative to China. Uh, it's, they've also talking about US te technologies or manufacturing devices or uh, participating in advanced semiconductors, all of these things being uh, prohibited to uh, Huawei. Uh, so I think these would be specific examples relative to 5G. Um, in terms of the exclusion of Huawei, uh, many country, other countries have also been taking various measures. Uh, recently, there's been a uh, accelerated uh, concentration or focus on something called Oran, which is a technical alliance. I would like to introduce uh, Oran a little bit to you on the next slide. Um, Oran. Uh, I think many of you already are aware, uh, is an open RAN. RAN is described here as a wireless or a radio access network. Uh, that's the meaning of RAN. Uh, ORAN was uh, originally Huawei, Nokia, and Ericsson. Uh, or, or sorry, uh, the goal was to prevent those countries from dominating 5G. Uh, it was uh, an, an effort to open up the uh, ORAN uh, initiated by US ATT, Deutsche Telekom, Japan, NTT, and so forth in 2018. Uh, that, now, uh, a feature of this uh, ORAN uh, is uh, that these three countries, uh, Huawei, Ericsson, Nokia, uh, rather than a dedicated run as they were proposing, that ORAN would be an open uh, interface, uh, which would allow a larger numbers of countries to participate. It's uh, difficult from the uh, technical standpoint, but the goal was to prepare such a, was to provide such a, a, a uh, infrastructure. Uh, so that would, compared to uh, dedicated networks, uh, this would be a more appropriate uh, measure. Uh, specific uh, measures within that, uh, this is an example of the British government uh, starting in November of last year, uh, 200, roughly $300 million, uh, three, uh, 350 million yen, 35 million, started a fund uh, to uh, develop open RAM, and uh, it was determined that NEC would participate. 
uh, uh, Wells, uh, Minister Wells said that uh, during this year, uh, a open 5G brand would be uh, spread throughout uh, England within this year. So it's a difficult a technical issue, but a very cha big challenge, uh, ambitious challenge. So uh, Oran, I think, uh, corresponds to a, uh, I can interpret as a technical alliance. Uh, so in other words, we're looking at the uh, 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 an, an example where there's a high potential for uh, linking business and security or economy and security. Uh, next page. Uh, next page, please. Next slide. Uh, yeah. yeah um, the second example uh, has to do with uh, Chinese uh, access to high tech information. Uh, this was explained by uh, Ambassador Miyagawa as well a moment ago. They have had industrial spies uh, or cyber attacks. Uh, they have used these illicit techniques. Uh, China has. Uh, to obtain uh, leading technology from other countries. Uh, and this includes Japan, uh, many uh, uh, leading uh, advanced countries have been exposed to this, uh, to this danger. Uh, we, so uh, there's in addition to that, uh, uh, investment in private countries, hiring of uh, technician, tech, uh, engineers, uh, uh, these are legal methods, cooperation and co uh, uh, joint de development and so forth. These things are also part of the picture. Uh, as Mr. Miyagawa said, the question is what sorts, we have to look at what kinds of technologies are being, uh, should be uh, uh, focused on and how do we protect them and to create uh, technical alliances in order to prevent, to make those possible. I think that's, a very important subject for us, specifically uh, industrial spies, cyber attacks, uh, uh, prevention of leaks of people and technology to Chinese companies, uh, and uh, also uh, outside of uh, the, we, we also need to increase, outside of the defense industry, we also need to increase the understanding of uh, commercial people about the risks that are involved. And uh, in Japan, uh, as Nishi-san said at the beginning, we need in Japan a security clearance uh, system. Uh, at the same time, uh, with respect to cybersecurity, we need to have cybersecurity. We need to have a higher uh, uh, level of capacity to face that. Next page, please. Uh, the next uh, effort uh, has to do with uh the defense technology corporation among alliance members as i said at the beginning in december of last year uh the us uh, dod uh just uh, published an international science and technology engagement strategy uh, uh in this uh document they talk particularly about uh russia and china particularly china's uh, very fast advancement and so the us was saying that as it, we was emphasizing its need to uh co collaborate cooperate with other countries uh, uh they talked about the importance of technical alliances uh my personal opinion uh is that uh for the total force of U.S. Uh, yeah, I, it's very hard for me to imagine that U.S. technical capacity would be less than uh, Russia or others. But it's uh, it's a fact that partially there are some areas where China is catching up, and there, that has led to a very high sense of crisis. Uh, uh, it's not possible to have. Uh, the point here is to have at least some difference, some uh, advantage over uh, China in each area. Uh, so this would be an area where the U.S. has uh, started uh, last year. They started uh, 2019. They started a new allied prototyping initiative uh, as a specific example. Uh, so the AI, uh, quantum technology, uh, the technologies that the U.S. sees as very important. Uh, uh, priority technologies uh, where they are co proposing cooperations. Uh, 
uh, the first uh, uh, item proposed would be uh, hypersonic jet engines that Norway has proposed. Uh, the second was Australia's for, for proposed, uh, again, hypersonic uh, uh, technology. For our country, Japan, uh, for example, uh, we are interested in uh, space areas where we could be a participant. Uh, and then, of course, uh, an, a premise for participating in this uh, project is that you have to have technology that would be uh, highly evaluated by the U.S. You have to have a high level of technology. Uh, therefore, the need is to uh, do R&D, not, not uh, only for the participate, uh, should we rely on the alliance, but in order to be participants in the alliance, we need to be able to uh, do our own R&D. Uh, and uh, there are, I think we also need to think about other frameworks that we can promote between countries. This is my, uh, finally, my last page, please. Um, uh, this is uh, ISIC's uh, member, uh, Mr. Simon Shelton uh, said, uh, he lives in England. Uh, I would like to introduce his words, uh, uh, which is to do with our theme today. Uh, technology, security, and cooperation. When he is saying that uh, technology development cooperation, particularly when military ha application uh, exists, requires trust that partners can keep sensitive information secure. I think uh, in terms of managing uh, information, this tells us how important the management of information is. Uh, these words are a good way of reminding us of that. That uh, concludes my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as I listened to you both, uh, I, I, I think that uh, the there, I, I get a good sense of the importance of and the seriousness of handling these technologies. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the U.S. has, uh, we have talked about the U.S.'s restrictions of technology against China in the focus, uh, with a focus on 5G, but will this uh, tend to spread into other areas? Of course, your personal opinion is, uh, is fine, but I would be curious how you see the U.S.-China relationship developing in the future. The U.S. now has a new administration, and so we're starting to see the cabinet line up bit by bit. We are, are seeing who will be uh, members of the Biden administration. But from that lineup, what can we say about this Biden administration's China strategy? It's a bit difficult to make such predictions, but let me venture a guess. First, We had the Trump administration and the understanding of China as a threat, especially in U.S. security circles. There was a, a bipartisan uh, understanding, I believe on these questions. So even if the Biden administration were to make drastic changes, even if there are changes from party to party, even if the character and nature of the president were to change greatly, I do not believe that the understanding of China as a threat would change very much. So 
with such an unchanged view of the China threat. I think that uh, various measures vis-a-vis -vis China, such as the restriction of sensitive technology, would be largely maintained. This is what uh, I imagine. Yesterday, the new press secretary of the new administration on China relations said, strategic patience could be partially admissible. Now, in uh, Japanese, we say this, uh, they said this uh, uh, from the back of their mouth. But I believe that we have to continue our diplomatic efforts such that all of the allies will have a common understanding. Just after the start of this new administration, I believe we need to move forward with cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Watanabe, you are a pra uh, specialist in communications. Uh, I would like to ask about this uh, 5G, this new communications uh, system uh, is being uh, uh, battled out between Japan and uh, between US and China. Uh, Huawei is making the lowest price and highest uh, quality uh, at the same time, uh, Ericsson is, is uh, also providing similar technology or uh, equipment. But uh, if you assume various, how does Oran that Japan is uh, proposing here fit into that? Uh, is it like Linux, uh, an open system that anyone can participate in? Uh, from my amateur point of view, it would seem like uh, an open system is one that allows or uh, carries the risk that if there is someone with evil intent, uh, they can easily participate. Is there, how does Oran, uh, is there something you feel about the risk aspects of Oran from that standpoint? Yes. Uh, first of all, Oran is an uh, uses an open interface uh, and it is a f uh, it, 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 it allows anyone to participate. That's a very big advantage, but uh, the mechanism, it, it's difficult to make this mechanism and to make this work. In fact, uh, the security problem, as you point out, is of course uh, present. Uh, with respect to equipment that's being developed, uh, that's certainly still ongoing. Uh, so I think from that standpoint, uh, England is, UK is conducting a very a large experiment and the security uh, checking will be done. There's something called a penetration test and so forth. Uh, those sorts of things will be applied to see what kinds of security risks actually uh, it will be exposed to. Uh, that will be go ongoing, I believe. So it's something which there still has many issues uh, to be resolved. Uh, if it is a dedicated uh, RAN, uh, of course, uh, those similar checks are done on the dedicated rig, but ORAN is something which is being conducted between, uh, with the cooperation between industries. Uh, so certainly the issue that you talk about is one that we will be up uh, focused on. There's something I wanted to add also um, uh, in your first question, Mr. Nishi, you mentioned, uh, you talked about five other than 5G technologies outside of 5G, how much of, will this spread? I, th there's something that hasn't been talked about very much, which is undersea cables. I think this is a serious issue as well. Uh, China, 
uh, Huawei is involved in this. There's something called Huawei Marine, a, a, a subsidiary of Huawei. Uh, uh, they have for some time, uh, there's been Subcom in the US, NEC and France's uh, Alcatel, uh, who have been essentially dominated 90% of the undersea uh, cable industry. Now, Huawei comes in at much uh, lower prices. So this is something the US is very concerned about, uh, worried about uh, information being absorbed by China in particular. This is something that US is worried about. So uh, this is being hotly debated uh, in the Pacific area. Uh, there's something called Kitty Bus. I think you're aware of that. Kitty Bus Connectivity is, is the name of the project. Uh, uh, not in the island of Shao, in the Kiribati uh, uh, archipelago, uh, the goal of this is to provide te communications te technology, which involves uh, the installation of undersea cables. Uh, the U.S. is very worried about this. Uh, uh, the uh, China has come in at low prices in the bid. Uh, uh, so, so that they would be able to absorb information in the Pacific region of China would be able to do so. This is a very uh, hotly debated uh, since the end of last year. It may not still be determined uh, who is going to take this, uh, but given the loss of security, uh, US has been issuing warnings about, uh, about this. Uh, that's one of the topics outside of 5G uh, that I, uh, one of the issues I think we're looking at right now. That's my comment. Thank you. Uh, the more I ask, the more I hear about risks or I'm aware of the risks that we're facing. But at the same time, uh, for Japan's economic world, uh, uh, the, China is a, uh, for, for, Amer for the U Japanese economic uh, world, both Japan and the US are important uh, markets. Uh, I think there's a lot of ways of looking at this, uh, but uh, when these, if these technological restrictions uh, are added, uh, as the ambassador said, uh, by taking an alliance standpoint, we, we're, in, we're going to end up having to take one of the markets, focus on one of the markets or not. Uh, we, so given that situation, as we go into the future, how do you think these restrictions will be strengthened? Or how will Japan's uh, economy's participation uh, develop? How will they make these decisions? Uh, how will they face these uh, re these uh, enforced or uh, greater, uh, more seriously restricted technologies? How, how and how will Japan uh, participate in these alliances? I would like to hear what your thoughts are, Ambassador. Thank you very much. The issue that you raise, I think, has two elements. The first would be how will technology, how will various sensitive technologies vis-a-vis -vis China and perhaps Russia, vis-a-vis -vis problematic countries, how will they directly increase those countries' military capabilities? This could be stealth technology. Various uh, technology has uh, military application, communications, satellite technology can directly lead to an increase in military capability. In cases where there is such a direct relationship, even if this uh, technologies uh, export could result in economic benefit. 
できない方向に議論は進んでいくのではないでしょうか。Uh, discussion is moving in the direction that would say that、uh, we cannot、uh, overlook this. Security is basic, it is, um, it's the infrastructure for everything. So, even if there is an economic benefit to be gained by exporting such sensitive technologies, the Government policy has to look at these questions strictly, I believe. And allies, countries that share the same goals, I think will begin to deal with these、uh, matters in a rigorous way. So I said there were two elements. The other element. I already touched on economic benefit. Economic strength can serve as a foundation for military buildups. In problematic countries, Economic growth increases overall strength. So, in a way, this is indirect. In a way, the, a process is required for this to happen, but there's still relevance. China is a member of the WTO, but If we leave things as they are, does China follow the same rules in competing as all of the other countries? I think these kinds of questions need to be raised. Chinese companies in many places in the world, something that's said often, they buy stocks. Of other countries, they buy land in other countries, they're free to do so. In spite of that, many countries and their companies cannot buy stocks of Chinese companies, cannot buy land in China. If they attempt to invest in China, then they are required to disclose their technology. And as a result of the disclosure of such technology, application is made of that technology to China's military. There is an imbalance in the rules, there's an imba imbalance in the compliance with respect to、uh, the rules. But for about 20 years, the international community. Has said that even though China is in the WTO, well, it's a large attractive market. And so it's been a, a situation that is advantageous just for China. As a result, China has become a very a large country and has become the second economic superpower. Even then, they continue to maintain a privileged system. And from the、uh, perspective of other countries, they are engaging in exploitation. Can this be、uh, continued? In the short term, there's still economic benefit to be had. And so it's true that in the short term, com companies and the private sector may、uh, have difficulty participating. But I think that we can all see that if we leave things as they are in the mid to long term, there will be、uh, problems and things will only get worse. We have to take appropriate measures. and My feeling is that 
We have to make the private sector understand this. Uh, it took me a long time to say that, but. Thank you very much. I often think with respect to how we look at China, uh, the priority is given to the 1.3 billion uh, market, but that doesn't, won't necessarily go well. Uh, but uh, they say, oh, no, no, we have reached uh, the world uh, level. Uh, we are participating in world level uh, rules. Uh, so they have said, I think it's a contradiction because they ignore the rules uh, and have done for 30 years. Uh, but it's not something that we can get anywhere with perhaps now by pointing, continuing to point this out. Uh, China itself, I think, has felt, is starting to feel the limitations of uh, their behavior to, to date. Uh, and I think we're going to be facing a very difficult, a very challenging uh, competition going forward. Uh, for, uh, in terms of a specific case in the US, uh, in Japan, I would like to ask, uh, Dr. Watanabe, um, the future fighter is something which uh, uh, will be a project for more than five years. I think it's a national project, we can say. Uh, we, when we introduced the F-35, uh, we had uh, lots, uh, very difficult restrictions from the US about technology. Uh, we had went through a lot of pain to re meet those requirements. But now, as we look at a yet further generation of technology uh, that would be in this uh, fighter plane, uh, I think we need to, on our own, as Japan, think about the restrictions on technology. So if we don't, then when we are trying to cooperate with the US and other countries, there is the possibility that uh, that information will leak, uh, that we will be exposed to that risk. Uh, this is an extremely, uh, I think, challenging issue. Uh, and as Japan uh, and, uh, further uh, participates in its own technology as the leading uh, uh, developer of its own technology. What do you think about this issue uh, uh, with respect to what you have both talked about today? Uh, this is, we're talking about a, an international network being created, but is it difficult for Japan to catch up with the international standard in this area? I would like to ask each of your opinions about that. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, was around during the introduction of the F-35 and knew about uh, the, uh, many times I was, it was pointed out from the US to me uh, about security issues uh, in, among commercial companies and also Japan, Japanese government. Uh, it, there were very tough uh, uh, statements that I still remember that came from the US on uh, Japan's security sense. Uh, but, uh, Japan, particularly the U.S., has become even more uh, sensitive about security uh, with the F-30 because a lot of technology from the F-35 did leak out. Uh, industrial spies, cyber attacks uh, that we've been talking about, these sorts of things led to leakage. Uh, it's not so much the secret information got out, but... Uh, 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 what I heard at the time uh, from the assistant secretary was that information that should have been managed, controlled, controlled classif classified information. Uh, uh, if uh, what they pointed out was that if this is not properly managed, uh, then uh, even looking at that non-secret information, quite a bit of secret information can be uh, conjectured if it is not properly managed. So this was a very big problem. Uh, after that, uh, very rapidly, uh, U.S. started to uh, take even more measures to control technology, control information. The problem is not so much the main contractors, but the supply chain. In the supply chain, uh, 
uh, the total control of information is something which is even in the US difficult to do. So uh, to some extent, some uh, references, reference levels or criteria have been developed for this uh, information. SB 877, uh, there's a uh, regulation which has been applied uh, and it, uh, what they're talking about applying to all companies uh, in the supply chain as well, which uh, to guard information. Some, this is very difficult. Uh, some companies I've heard have dropped out, uh, relatively large companies have dropped out because of this. Uh, so it's difficult to implement, but Japan has to do it too. Uh, currently, that CAY information, CCY information, uh, in other words, information that should be protected uh, is uh, something which in Japan we are creating new rules uh, right now, new criteria for this. Uh, we have to keep thinking about that very clearly. Uh, and it has to be, it's going to be difficult to manage this information across the whole supply chain. But I think that uh, small companies, uh, it's hard to ask small companies to do all of the security work that large companies would do. Uh, that, but that doesn't mean we should loosen the restrictions on small companies. Uh, it, it, and this is difficult, uh, but we need to overcome this issue, this difficulty uh, somehow or other. Because on the Japan side, uh, each person needs to know, each company needs to know what it what it needs to do, what it, arrangements it needs to make, and that has to be on an international uh, criteria level uh, for us to participate. So this uh, there's going to be trial and error probably, uh, but I think this is going to be a very important prototype issue, uh, as you, um, Mr. Nishi, have pointed out. That's what I would say about that. Thank you very much. Uh, today's issue was a very important issue. It's, uh, I think this was uh, not enough discussion about such an important uh, issue. As we get into more and more concrete co discussion, we see that the, the weight on us, the, the role that we have to play gets bigger and bigger uh, in these engagements. Uh, today, we will see as the first issue, uh, the first time for us to discuss this, and we need to continue uh, these uh, discussions in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Watanabe, Ambassador Thank you. Uh, Miyagawa, for your participation. Uh, uh, we will end this uh, first 2021. Uh, the next uh, issue